walk you through all of this. Any questions at this point? Town. I was going to bring this up later, but... But bring it up now, then. Bring it up now. Uh, back to your principles. Could we, could we possibly add a principle that would be um, something about the role and orientation of barriers? Mm -hmm. Which is to say, a barrier that's, that's oriented north-south has different consequences. Yep and a barrier that's oriented east-west. Absolutely. So, and why would that be? Well, I mean, let's think about uh, warming temperatures and North Africa. Okay, what's north of North Africa? Mm -hmm. The Mediterranean. Yeah. And so all of those montane, um, temperate climate species that are presently in what the Atlas Mountains in Morocco and the mountains in Libya, as climates warm, we expect them to move to higher latitudes. Yep. And yet they've got this east-west barrier, which is the Mediterranean. Yeah. Yep. And so they're kind of up against a wall. Yep. And we saw that in South Africa as well. We saw when species had no w where to move poleward, then all they could do was move up slope. And so a corollary of that principle would be that the orientation of mountains is very important as well. So east-west trending mountains like the Alps will play a very different role than north-south uh, trending mountains such as those in, that are typical of the Afro-Montane. And the reason for that is, if you think about a, sp let's think about a species that has its range <coughs> moving poleward, okay, so I'm from the northern hemisphere, so my poleward is going to move north. So this species is moving north and there's a mountain range like this. Well then as it hits that mountain range, then it's going to have upslope uh, tracking ability, which, and one, another important thing to mention is, you know, you can, track climate upslope over much shorter distances than you can with latitude, right? So if you're tracking up a mountainside, uh, you can move a few hundred meters and adjust for several degrees of climate change. Whereas if you're on a flat surface and you have to adjust latitudinally, you're going to have to move hundreds of kilometers probably. Um, so moving upslope in mountains is a much uh, I wanna, don't want to say easier, but you know, it's a much uh, less space-consuming uh, enterprise. You can, you can track suitable climate over a short distance in the mountains. If you have to do it across a flat su surface, a plain, um, someplace with no mountains, it takes a lot more distance. So if a species is moving latitudinally, it's having to move across large areas, means it would have to be moving very fast to keep up with climate change. And then it hits a mountain and suddenly it can track climate change by moving up slope and that can do that over a much shorter distance. Well, if the mountain range is oriented east-west and the species is moving this way, then it only gets that benefit um, for a certain part of its range, when it gets to that mountain range, then suddenly it can adjust to climate change much more easily. If the mountain range is oriented north-south and the species range is here somewhere, as it tracks northward, it also can move very easily into the mountains and track climate change over much shorter distances. So north-south trending mountains actually have an advantage for many species in tracking climate change and east-west trending mountains have an advantage, but it comes into play in a different way because it, it can't help the species ac across a large part of its range or through extended tracking of climate change. Oh, we're back, excellent. Okay, so back to where we were. We just saw that ice core 20 minutes ago now, and that ice core had information about past climates in it. Uh, Part of that information had to do with sea level rise. We're not going to pay attention to that right now. We're just going to pay attention to the CO2 reading, which is taken as a proxy for global mean temperature. So when I say global mean temperature, I just mean you take the, the average temperature of every place on the globe, uh, you average it all together, and that's the global mean temperature. 
it's used in climate change policy because we can ask how warm we want the entire planet to become uh, in response to human greenhouse gases. Um, it's used in paleoecology as just a general index of how warm the planet is. But for biologists, it's not really a very useful index because we don't care about the average temperature of the whole planet. We care about the climate or weather in the place where the species we're looking at exist. So we'll, we'll take this one look at global mean temperature, and then after this, we won't be very concerned about the planet as an average. We'll be concerned about individual places where species are responding to actual on-the-ground climate. Okay, so what this trace shows, and it's a little similar to that global mean temperature trace I showed that went back hundreds of millions of years, but you know, up is warm, down is cool, and what you see is that there are periods when the planet's warmer, periods when it's cooler, and they're tending to alternate here. Well, these are the ice ages, or the glacial and interglacial periods. So here's an, a warm interglacial period, here's a glacial period, Here's an interglacial. Here's our current interglacial here. It's preceded by a long glacial period. Here's the previous interglacial period, which is again sort of a short interlude after quite a long period of, of cold uh, conditions. And so that's what global temperature looks like uh, in, the, in an ice core record. So that's a very fundamental thing that paleoecologists use to sort of assess what's happening with temperature globally, but also in individual parts of the world. And paleoecologists are then trying to, to track what's been happening with species, especially plants that leave behind fossils or po fossil pollen that can be tracked through these, these times. And you'll find that some plants that are warm loving will, ex will become more abundant when we have one of these warm interglacials and will become less abundant when we're in an ice age, which just sort of makes sense. Um, but paleoecologists will refer to wiggle matching, which is a highly technical term for there are a bunch of wiggles in the, the climate record, and there are a bunch of wiggles in the fossil or pollen record about how abundant species are. And you try and match those up sometimes to ask whether climate is driving particular changes in plants or other species. If the wiggles match, if the climate wiggle matches the, the plant wiggle, then it's likely that the climate change is causing the change in plants. And if the two wiggles don't line up, well then it's likely that, they, that whatever you're seeing in the plants are not um, caused by climate change. Okay, so we showed a picture of an ice core to sort of show how we get our data about climate. How do we get our information about um, biodiversity? How do we get our information especially about plants? Um, well, I've sort of just said that. What, part of it is from the fossil record, and some of it is from the pollen record, which is uh, determined from pollen that falls, rains into lakes and wetlands, and similarly to the ice core in some ways forms lamination, so there are annual layers of pollen laid down. And so you can dig down into that sediment at the bottom of a lake by using a different kind of a coring tool. So we saw to drill into ice you had to have sort of a big drill and a large bore uh, core to pull up an ice core out of, you know, solid ice that's uh, hundreds of meters thick in Greenland. Well, when you want to pull up a core of mud out of the bottom of a lake, you use the same thing, which is a hollow tube, but a much different bore. And so here's Mark Bush, who's an excellent tropical paleoecologist, and one of his students, uh, Susanna Mosbleck, driving a coring tool down into the sediments of this lake in the Andes. And so what they're doing is they're just taking a hollow tube, like a pipe essentially, driving it down into the mud, uh, taking, taking a sample of that mud and bringing it up. And so then you've got a, round, a cylindrical piece of mud that has all these laminations in it. And each one of those laminations will contain pollen that's trapped in that layer. And because you can count those laminations, those sort of layers, to find out how many years back you're looking, 
you can look at the pollen, ask what plants it came from, and draw conclusions about what plants were around this tropical lake um, when a particular climate was occurring. So just to sort of go through how that looks, you can see, I think, some trees in the background here, some grasses, um, probably some shrubs up on some of these cliff sides. So all of those plants are producing pollen. It's getting blown around and it'll settle down into the water. So the grasses produce pollen. It blows over the lake and then settles down into the lake and gets trapped in that layer of mud that's laid down year by year in the lake. And then Mark gets the mud up, puts it on a microscope plate, looks for pollen grains in there and asks what kinds of pollen is there and how abundant is it. And he makes a little trace about the, the pollen that's there. And then he reconstructs the vegetation around the lake. So this current vegetation would, you know, have a certain percentage of, plant, of grass pollen, some shrubs, a few trees. If climate was much colder, it might be all grass around here and you'd have nothing but grass. And so then when Mark pulls the, that core up and he's in a layer that was in a cooler period, he may see only grass or mostly grass. And so that's to a large extent how we get our information about how plants have moved in response to, plant, to past climate. So let's look at some North American examples of this. And we said, remember, that we expect as climate warms that plants will move poleward and upslope. So the most recent warming event not caused by people was the transition from the last glacial period. There was a, a glacial period that it began to end about 20,000 years ago, and the planet's been warming uh, for about 10,000 years since then. So we have a transition from the glacial period to now, and we can ask, well, what happened to plants when it was an ice age, and how did they transition into the current interglacial? Do you have a question on the dean? No. no. Okay. Okay, so these figures, interestingly enough, don't have dates on them, but the blue is the ice sheet. So the glacier, sort of the glacial period, is represented by this ice sheet. And you can see that it's gradually disappearing, OK? At the coldest, when the ice sheet is big, uh, this oak species is compressed far away from the ice sheet, OK? As, the ice, as conditions warm in the transition from the last glacial, the ice sheet retreats, and the oak begins to uh, increase in abundance farther north. So you see the different colors of green are how abundant, let's just say, oak pollen is at the time. So in the record from 20,000 years ago that comes up in a mud core and you count back 20,000 years, you find, you don't find much oak pollen in lakes up here, but you find oak pollen in lakes further south. As conditions warm, the ice retreats and the oaks move farther north. And that pattern continues. The oaks are becoming very abundant in the f farther south, southern parts of their range, but are extending up towards the Canadian border. This is about the Canadian border here. As the ice sheet completely disappears, then the oaks begin to occupy areas that had been covered by ice before. So here's that poleward rain shift that we talked about. Starts in the south, as conditions warm, we know it's warming because the ice sheet is disappearing. As conditions warm, the species is moving north or poleward. And if you use your imagination, you can see a little of upslope movement because you'll see that the, the oak is moving a little more rapidly in the, the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern part of the U.S. So that pattern's not uh, incredibly clear here, but the poleward movement moving northward to track changing climate is, is very obvious. Um, okay, so that's just one species um, moving to follow the, ice, the retreating ice sheet and warming conditions. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about that? We'll look at the tropics soon too, so don't despair if you're a tropical biologist. Okay. So that establishes the first 
two principles we talked about really 